Hi there everyone, welcome back to Objectivity here at the Royal Society with Head Librarian Keith and two very large magnetic spherical objects from the collection. Indeed, Torelli. Torelli? Yep. Or one Torella. Mm -hmm. What is a Torella? It's a magnetised chunk of stone or metal in the shape of a globe. And where the word Torella comes from is from the Earth. So mm. this is supposed to be sort of a, a mini Earth. That's right, yes. You could model magnetic poles using one of these things. They've been around for a very long time because the early Royal Society was interested in magnetism. What better things to have in your repository than, than some Torelli? They come off their stands. Can I hold one? Yes, do, by all means. It's quite heavy. Oh, yeah. It is heavy. It's got a few dents out of it, hasn't it? It's seen a bit of action. And these are very useful for things like modelling, aurora, the Earth's magnetic field, understanding things it's like that. It's magnetism, yes. Yeah. So we're very curious about magnetic phenomena. Uh, it's very difficult before they could make artificial magnets. Uh, they had to rely on, on naturally occurring ones. So they were prized objects. So now the thing we want to talk about next is the Royal Society's repository from yeah. which these came. Yeah. This isn't the library as we know it today, the archives that we show people mm. every week. This is sort of a bit further back when things were a little bit more uh, Wild West, a little bit more crazy, or just a different era? Well, it was a different era. Uh, there weren't any national museums in the same way that we might have the British Museum today. Uh, therefore, uh, the Royal Society began collecting things, not just papers, not just paintings, but objects and, and things to do with natural history and the natural world. Now, we've got a few documents and books mm. here that list what was in the repository at this time. That's right. The society appointed a curator called Nehemiah Grew. Like your predecessor? One of my predecessors, yeah. And uh, he began to, to list things. He published a catalogue of the repository. And successive librarians in the 17th and 18th century updated that. They kept lists of things coming in, and we have a few of them here. So this is a list here of minerals, earths, stones, and bitumens. And you can see straight away, top of the list, 4th of November, 1663, a lodestone. What's a lodestone? So it's basically just a, a magnetic stone of some kind. So these are lodestones in mm. a way. Here in uh, 1660 to 1661, so January, this is just after the Royal Society is established, two lodestones sent by Sir Robert Moray and the donor here, King Charles II. So King Charles II, founder of the Royal Society, yeah. was donating magnetic stones. But the thing that I find interesting is looking through some of these documents at the other things that used to be kept in the repository. They had fantastic collections of all manner of things. This one in particular has caught our attention today. We have here a list of human rarities that were kept. Number one on the list, an Egyptian mummy given by the Duke of Norfolk. And then next, we have a male human fetus mm -hmm. of about yeah. four months. Then we have a list of similar objects. These are preserved specimens, so they would keep uh, not just plants, but animal specimens and human specimens as well. The face of a monstrous child without eyes or nose. I think if there's one thing they found more interesting than human birth defects, it was animal birth defects. Mm -hmm. We have a monstrous calf with two heads, one body and two tails. The skin of a lamb with eight legs, four ears, one head, and two tails. The thing you can probably notice about this book is that it's classified, that they're attempting to classify all the materials in the natural world in a pre linnaean way, and to organize them physically in rooms along these lines. It's actually very interesting from the way they, they thought about the natural world. But what would it have smelt like? Probably not very good. Yeah, it would be lots of spirits, of course. They would have to preserve these things in spirits, wines, and, and by other means, by, by drying them. So uh, the, the material would be uh, around and about, and you, people who wanted to study these things could. But visitors to the Royal Society were shown these things. You would be taken around, and, and if you were very privileged, you might be allowed to handle some of these objects, Brady, in a way that you'd probably recognise. It was a huge collection. I mean, when the Royal Society was based in, in Crane Court, they actually had an architect in testing the floor loadings. They thought the place was going to collapse. It was very badly kept for a long time. Of course, just natural degradation of these materials and insects 
insect infestations would have taken care of a lot of it, some of this material would have simply rotted away. The answer was given by Sir Hans Sloan, president of the Royal Society. He established under his will the British Museum. Towards the end of the 18th century, the Royal Society handed its core collection, the things that remained, over to the British Museum, and they, they formed part of the British Museum's early collections. Well, as the head of the library at the Royal Society, does that horrify you to think that all this wonderful stuff uh -huh. was given away? Well, um, by that stage, a lot of it wasn't very wonderful. The difficulty is because the material has changed hands many times, the Royal Society kept the material badly. The identification, the, the kind of chain of evidence, if you like, has gone. And you can see it here. So this is uh, an inventory of some of the human rarities in the collection. So this is antiquities, machines, models, things that the Royal Society owned. And you can see here, uh, this is from 1765, so rather later. And the provenance of some of these things is beginning to be lost. So some of these donations are assigned to particular people and the descriptions are quite good. But in other cases, the descriptions are rather poor. So curious works of art we have here. And it says a cast of a man's face in wax. Now that could be anything. Mm. However, we do know that in the early days from these catalogues, the Royal Society had a portrait of Sir Robert Moray, who is arguably the founder of the Royal Society, in wax. This is probably it, but already the association that it is Moray has been lost. I wonder where that is now. There are no portraits of Maury that we know about. So... That's the only one. So it's possible that we have a cast of Moray's face, this famous founder of the Royal yep. Society, that we know about, and then by the time it makes it to this document, it's just someone's face in wax. Yep. That could have gone to another museum somewhere in London. It could yep. still be sitting there. It could be sitting in the British Museum somewhere. Of course, it could have been broken. Wax things are very fragile. But I'd like to think somewhere that some of these things survive. So possibly somewhere there is a likeness of Moray, someone we have no likeness of, yep. sitting within a few miles of us. S sitting anonymously. The, 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 the connection has been broken, but maybe just still recoverable. Cool. That's cool. <laughs> We've got to find that. You yep. gotta find it. Come on, Keith. Let's get out there and find it. This box alone seems like a an insight into I, this man's mind. Yeah, I know. A lot of mathematicians have a box of puzzles and things at home. So for me, it feels like this is his box of puzzles and he was working on making his own. He's a popularizer of mathematics. He yeah. wants everyone to enjoy maths puzzles and so he's made them. That's so good.